Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. The recording has started. Everything should work now, hopefully. So today we continue with our next section on the Gaussian distribution. You might be surprised that you can have a whole lecture on the Gaussian distribution. Um, as a little preview, it's a quote from Philip Hennig, who is a professor in um, Tübingen University. And he was one of my colleagues when I was in Tübingen. And um, he says the Gaussian distribution is a linear algebra of probability theory, okay? And we will see today what he means by that. I don't know where he got the quote from. Maybe he came up with it himself, or he got it from David Mackay. So he was a student of David Mackay, one of, uh, one of the, the great machine learning researchers. Um, and there's also free books from David Mackay you might have a, have a look at. I think I quoted it at the beginning. So maybe it's also from him, I don't know. But the Gaussian distribution, there's a lot to say about it because it has really nice properties and we will see why it has these properties. But before, let's have a very brief look back what happened so far, what have we done already. Okay, so we talked about probability theory as an extension of propositional logic. So why did we do it that way? Because it's a very pretty introduction to probability theory and it's I guess different from the stuff that you learned already in your math classes. So it's a different point of view on probability. So I think it's very useful. However, of course, at the end, it should be the same theory and it should be the same tools, okay? It's just a different way to motivate it. Um, also, um, in classical AI, um, logic was playing a really big role, like the robot who comes in and whatever takes away the dirt or brings me some coffee or something. So the re robot has to do some reasoning. And in, in, in early years of AI at the beginning, people were mainly trying to model everything with logic. So it was like the natural starting point. So the robot has to reason about getting into the room. If the door is open, just go ahead. If the door is not open, st start the, the sub-program to push down this, this handle here to open the door and so on and so forth. So everything kind of looks Logical. However, sometimes things can be broken, right? So the door could be broken. Or maybe there's a, a chair standing in front of the door, some other weird stuff. So there's some noise in the real world. So basically the observations are typically noisy. The world is super noisy and it's not so nicely casted in logical rules. So that's like a good foundation and it's handling many cases, but with probabilities we are much more flexible. And it turned out that now probabilities are everywhere and in a way also deep learning, trying to um, learn these neural networks is basically assuming certain probability distributions on the data and then doing some estimation. Yeah? So basically it's also a point of view that you can have on these techniques. So probability series is the foundation for me for machine learning. We looked at discrete variables and also some with a fishy construction on continuous variables, but I think it's fun that you can introduce it from the propositional logic side. And we looked at graphical models as representation for probability density function, also for probability mass functions that have certain conditional independencies. So these graphical models are tools by themselves, which are fun, right? I mean, expert systems, that's an interesting topic in AI. And you could build expert systems with these graphical models, right? That's very nice um, to, to have these probabilities in there as well, right? Otherwise, when you, when you look in your, there were these websites, these expert system websites also had a problem with your printer. And then you start with the first question and then they typically ask you, so do you really have a printer of this brand? Second question, did you plug in the power plug into the printer? Third question, did you plug in the power plug into the outlet? Fifth question, did you switch on the printer and so on? So if you would have probabilities on these Ha events, then they would be very low that that is the real reason, right? I mean, typically when you go to these websites, you are able to go to a help website, which already means you are a power user. And so probably the trivial stuff you all have tried. So it would be nicer if it's like the question with the power plug comes at the very end, if everything that is more likely has been tried already, right? So that would be much more useful. So I don't know. I think that's enough for motivating these things. On the other hand, um, like in the example with the wearing glasses, also for something super simple like estimating the probability of a coin or estimating the probability of wearing glasses, yeah, having IID data, having observations, you can also view as a graphical model as I showed you. 
and you can kind of get some intuitions why the mass is how it is from the graphical structure. Yeah? And we will also have similar insights in um, Gaussian processes. Typically, there are sometimes derivations in these machine learning books with probabilities where they say, and here this variable is independent of another variable, so I can omit it in my derivation, and I don't have, I no longer have to condition on it, or something like that. This is always quite difficult then to understand because the reasoning is a bit fuzzy to say, yeah, it's kind of independent. But once you draw the graphical model for the derivation, then you can see with this separation, yes, they have nothing to do with each other, I can omit it. So it gives you a, like a second view on a derivation as well. So I think it's super useful in itself. Um, now, next thing, what is inference? These words, inference, reasoning, they are super overloaded, right? So every branch of science has their own inference and their own reasoning. And so the same is here. So, but we, when we talk about inference, we basically mean um, we could distinguish between logical reasoning and probabilistic reasoning. So in logical reasoning, for example, you have some binary variables being either true or false. Binary, also sometimes called propositional variables, okay? In logical reasoning, we would define some axioms, what we assume to be true, and then we use inference rules, something like if you have the formula A and B, you can infer the formula A, or modus ponens, or some other rules, to derive new facts from the axioms, okay? And you can only say whether something is strictly true or strictly false, okay? So that is logical reasoning. Furthermore, it's typically monotonic, okay? There are some hacks how to get around it, but most logic is monotonic. Yeah? Of course, Google for non-monotonic reasoning or mon non-monotonic logic, and you will find some very interesting proposals how to do it. But I think the non-monotonicity comes more natural with the probabilities, where we had things like explaining away and some other really nicely working stuff that works very well with our common sense. So in monotonic reasoning, just as a side note, so the more knowledge I have, the more axioms I assume, the more statements I can derive to be true, okay? And this is, sounds good, but it's not always good. Like when you get a new um, statement like penguins are birds, and before you were saying all birds are flying, then it might be not a good thing that now you can also prove that penguins can fly, right? But in your logical reasoning system, that's what your robot would conclude. So there's probabilistic reasoning, which I like to view it as an extension of logic, which is kind of pretty. There we go. Instead of defining axioms, we're defining a joint probability distribution. And in a similar way, like axioms are defining our world, right? What's happening if a door is open or if it's closed? What are my possibilities? Similarly, the joint probability is defining what's possible and what's likely, but not only what's possible, but also how likely is that certain situations come. So in particular, it looks like an innocent little expression here, but this could be really a big beast, right? Suppose you have 26 variables, you have already two to the 26 minus one numbers to store in different states that are possible. So this is describing the whole universe, right? So this is describing everything that we care about in our situation. So this is basically defining the model in a way, in this case, if you view it very general. Now, if we have some known facts, like z variable is equal to little z, okay, then we condition on that. And conditioning and observation, that's observing that's kind of synonymous in this situation. It's basically the same thing. If we observe something, then these things are facts, and on the facts we condition, okay? So we put them as a side condition behind the bar, and then this changes the probability distribution of the other variables here. So basically, similar to having these axioms, and then maybe one axiom could be pensions are birds, then also further statements kind of are triggered, and they were not uh, provable before, and suddenly they get true or false. And similarly here, by having these additional known facts, the probability distribution is changing of x and y. And the probability distribution of x and y is, again, a description of the world involving only those two variables. Okay? Good. Then the next step is, there might be non-interesting variables still on the left-hand side. For example, the y might be non-interested. Maybe we are interested in the statement p of x given z for a certain value z. Then the starting point is the joint, you condition on the known fact, you integrate out the non-interesting random variables, and then basically you have your new belief about the world. You have a new probability distribution where you got rid of all the non-interesting stuff by just averaging it out, okay? 
averaging out is the sum rule and conditioning on the known stuff. And curiously, this probabilistic reasoning needs exactly two mechanisms. One is the product rule and one is the sum rule. So they, I'm just telling you this at this length so that you, you can view this, the product rule and the sum rule like as, an, as a theorem following from Kolmogorov's axioms. You can view it like a mathematical fact, but you can also have some intuition about, so why do we need the product rule? Where in our reasoning are we using it? And the, the product rule is used to condition on known facts. That's something very concrete. And the sum rule is necessary to sum out non-interesting stuff. Okay, so that's basically where these things really, what they are used for. And this is sometimes also called marginalization. You might have heard the statement or the, 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 the definition that there's a joint distribution of several variables and you can marginalize basically towards one of the variables or towards a subset. So in German, I think it's called Randverteilung. Yeah? So you take only the margin of it, but it could be any subset. So that's marginalization. Actually, often in derivations, in machine learning books, and people write down probabilities and say, and now we marginalize blah, blah, blah. And this is synonymous for saying, now we apply the sum rule to a certain variable. Okay, so th this is like wordings. Those are just clever ways to write, uh, to, to explain stuff. Good. Um, after we've done that, basically we got the posterior probability. Okay, so in a way the story is a bit longer because we define our joint probability distribution by saying what is our initial belief about x by specifying p of x and then we would say if the x has a certain value, what would be a distribution for y, which is the likelihood and so on and so forth. So we construct the joint typically out of these mechanisms, right? But here now I just wrote, wrote that we just have the joint given in some form. Okay, it could be a graphical model, it could be anything. Anyway, at the end we have a new belief about our variable that we are interested in in x given z. So given that this, this uh, soccer player Arland switches to München, yeah, what is the probability that Borussia Dortmund becomes uh, the German soccer champion. Okay, so that would be a statement we would like to answer, for example. That's quite interesting. And actually, suppose you like betting money on these things, yeah, and now you have these superpowers of probabilistic reasoning, yeah, you should use it, right? You're, so you should, should try to make, make use of these graphical models, so it could be very useful. For example, whether the, the soccer player switches to Bavaria Munich doesn't change anything for Hertha BSC, so there are independencies which you should take care of in your graph, right, if you like soccer. Okay, good. So this is logical reasoning versus probabilistic reasoning. And I could have started already with something like this, but it's typically in a talk, you first say what you want to say, then you say it and you say it again, that you said it, and this is like similar. So we introduce the nitty gritty details of this, and this should give you just another view on the same stuff that we learned about it. So I also I included now this given age, Thing. So basically all probability distributions here, of course, could be also conditioned on other probability, uh, on other random variables. Where sometimes in hypothesis, um, like in statistical, mathematical statistics, it's typically like a binary variable, which is true or false, right? For example, that the means are the same of two distributions or something. But in principle, the age could be anything. The age could be like any set of random variables that you can condition on. And of course, all these rules also hold if you condition on anything else. Good, what else? So we looked at graphical models to efficiently represent probability distributions. And typically, they kind of are, are made in such a way that the direction is also the causal direction, or those are the mechanism, how we think that the data was generated, okay? So for example, there is an, uh, there's another um, star out there with some planet going around, okay? We have a model how this goes with what speed the exoplanet is going around the sun, and this will generate a certain light curve of the star. The star will always, the light curve drops a bit if the planet is passing in front of the star, if we are lucky from our perspective here on Earth. And then we would, assuming a certain setup here with the sun, with some star and with some planet going around it. And this is generating a certain light curve that we could write down a formula for. And then we could say this light curve will generate the following curve on our detector and our telescope. And this will turn out to be 
a certain uh, row of numbers in my computer then. Okay, and now I have to do it the other way around. So this could be the description of the joint distribution. And now from this description of the joint distribution, I might want to infer, given this measured light curve, what is the probability that there is an exoplanet? Okay, and I'm inverting the whole thing. And in principle, I'm doing the probabilistic reasoning. However, of course, this is like the idealistic case. Um, this is like the idealistic reasoning, how we would love to do it. There are certain problems. Integration is super hard, right? So certain integrals we just cannot solve. You can then numerically integrate and solve this, but often this kind of reasoning cannot be done in practice. But it's like the correct way to do it, in my opinion, but in practice we often cannot do it, and then we have to approximate and use some hacks. Okay, that's just how it is. Um, so for the graphical model, again, I was here explaining, so typically we model the arrows into the right direction, how we would think that the data was generated. However, that is not required. So uh, suppose you take a fully connected graph, you can have any um, acyclic graph and it can, can basically model any joint distribution if all arrows are in. However, typically you get nicer graphs with fewer arrows if those describe really the mechanism kind of in the order of things. But this is just an observation. There's a full other lecture that is kind of trying to find out, so now what is it with causality, right? So that's also a very interesting topic. There are other directed, um, undirected graphical models that are not part of this lecture. They could also look like this with an undirected graph. And um, so what would be an application of that one? Yeah, consider an image, for example, right? So if you have an image with pixels, typically a pixel in an image is very correlated to its neighboring pixels, but not so correlated to pixels which are far away in the image. Right, so this color here on my um, pullover has the same color across the, all these pixels of my pullover. So they are very correlated, but suddenly something happens and I get a different color. So suddenly they are not correlated very much anymore. However, maybe dark blue pullovers are correlated to mathematically dark green blackboards. So maybe there is a correlation in typically images because there, I have ne never seen a blackboard which was pink or something. So there might be a correlation between my fashion style and the background, but maybe not, okay? Even more complicated, there's a certain texture here, right? So sometimes there's something, some other texture. So also locally, if you look like at some subset of pixels, you could imagine there's a, a probability distribution that describes the texture of the shirt, okay? So there are some relations. But the further away you go away from your, the single pixel, right, the, further, the less is the correlation. This could be captured with graphical models like this. However, here's no ordering. So here's no earlier or later. So this is all happening at the same time. So it kind of makes sense to omit the arrows, okay? And so this is like a different way to describe complicated probability distributions. There are Markov random fields and other things that are related to this. And then if you generalize this even further, so this is, I said already, this is like generating data, right? So you can go along the graph. So why not write a computer program that is generating data? So in a way, this is like a computer program, right? You first sample from R, you sample from S, and then once you have R and S, you sample from T. This is like computer code that is already giving some order in which I should sample these different variables, right? So, but how do you do an if-then-else? How do you do a while loop and all these things? It could be a generator as well to do it like this. So you first sample your first coin and um, then you iterate as long as your current sampled one is showing heads, you go ahead and sample again, okay? And I think this distribution also has a name. It's this distribution where you throw coins until you see the first um, tail, okay? Is it negative binomial or something? I forgot the name, but there is a name for this one, okay? The key thing here is it could happen that you have only five random variables. It could be 10 random variables, just depending on how often you've seen heads, okay? So you can generate more interesting stuff, and it's not so easy to write a graphical model for this one, okay? because you would need some dot, 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 some iteration. So the stopping condition is also random, okay? It's not fixed. Good, so this is even more general. And if you Google for probabilistic programming, there's another world about how to do inference. Of course, it gets much more complicated than in a graph, okay? And I think it's still an open problem how to do it right or how to do it efficiently. 
Good, so those are other things. Then there are more few technical terms that we've seen. We've seen base rule, which is actually a theorem, and base rule is nothing you need to memorize. You only need to memorize the product rule and the sum rule. And then you have your base rule, right? If you take twice the product rule for a joint distribution. This is just bringing um, the P of Y to the other side. However, playing here certain roles, typically base rule is viewed like this. X is the unknown, the question whether there is an exoplanet or not. Y is my data, so that is my file in my computer that got transmitted from my super telescope that I have on my roof. And then I have a prior belief maybe. I've seen some stars with exoplanets, so I have a distribution. I know something about these stars, how likely it is that basically the, 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 the um, trajectory of the planet is in the right angle for me to see it from Earth, right? There might be a certain probability distribution. And maybe all stars have planets. Maybe that's the case. I have no idea. But so I could express it in here. I could also basically the P of X is expressing all the scientific knowledge I have so far. And again, this is a bit idealistic, right? How do I express all the scientific knowledge so far in a function P of X? Of course, in practice, then it's again, oh, I have a Gaussian distribution. It des describes my prior knowledge. That's my prior knowledge. But of course, conceptually, it should include everything I know, right? But in practice, it's, it never will. Then there's the likelihood, and those are just technical terms that you read very often, right? And they always refer to this base rule. Um, the likelihood, of course, also appears in uh, classical statistics, and we will see how maximum likelihood and maximum a posteriori, these kind of things are related to each other, I guess, in the next lecture. So the likelihood tells us how likely is the data y for a fixed value of x. So for a fixed value of my parameter, how likely is it to see this data? So assuming there is an exoplanet, how likely is that I have this and this data? Or if there's no exoplanet, how likely is that I have another curve? Um, it's called likelihood and not a probability because it's viewed typically as a function of x, right? So this is like going back and forth. So I'm saying here the value x is fixed because I'm interpreting it as a conditional probability distribution over y, but once I'm doing the inference, the data is fixed, my observation is fixed, and the x is the unknown, and in principle I can, could plug in different values for x. So it's a function of x, and I can play around with it, or I can maximize it for maximum likelihood, and all these things. And since it's not normalized with respect to the x, it's only normalized with respect to the y, right? So I can integrate over all possible values of x, or sum them out, and it doesn't have to be 1 at the end, okay? For that reason, it's not called a probability, but a likelihood. But this is just the name. Then there's the evidence, and basically it's the integration of the nominator, integrating out on top the x. Another way to view it is, so this possibility of having the data y, comma, a certain hypothesis x, right? How is this reweighted by all possibilities, right? These all possibilities is the evidence. All possibilities meaning I'm summing up for all possible x I sum up the probability of seeing this data, right? And that is the evidence, basically summing out all possibilities. And since I said the joint should be gigantic, includes all our knowledge, you see how difficult this is typically, right? And you know that only physicists can solve certain integrals, and there are also integrals that physicists cannot solve, and I can solve even fewer integrals, right? So typically it's not working nicely. However, I gave you already a hint there about these conjugate distributions, right? Some conjugate prior, and today we will see more conjugate priors. So those are the choices for P of X and P of Y given X, where everything is nice, where the integration can be done. So this conjugacy is like nice, right? And it's kind of allowing us to do these calculations. By the way, this kind of point of view with base rule and these kind of things, this is typically called Bayesian reasoning, and there's always a debate between frequentist or Bayesianism. However, I don't know whether the debate is over. I think the, the I don't know, of the die-hard frequentist people who dislike the Bayesian reasoning completely. Typically, the, the expert statisticians, they know both points of views, and they kind of take the both tools from both sides, okay? And that also should be your point of view. So don't become a Bayesian like who ignores all the frequency stuff, 
just because you read a paper why p-values are so bad and so stupid. So p-values also have their value at some point, and at some point they kind of give you garbage. That's just how it is, okay? So no all methods, yeah? So that is the hint. What else do we have? At the end, we have the posterior, which is then what we know after seeing the data. So we start with the p of x, what we know before seeing the data, and then we have another description of what we know after seeing the data, okay? And the base rule tells us what to do. Um, that I told you already, yeah, probabilities are normalized, likelihoods are not. But this is a bit a confusing statement. Of course, the likelihood is also normalized if you fix x and integrate out the y, then it's normalized, but not normalized with respect to the x. Good. Those are, again, a few technical terms. And the usual thing is you get the stuff presented once and then maybe with detail and you have to look at it again to kind of see the connections, how everything works together. Good, let's get started with our famous distribution, the Gaussian distribution. It's so famous, like there are nice, there's a nice picture of it on the 10 mark shine. Yeah? So there was not always the euro. I forgot when it was introduced, the euro, but at some point we switched from the Deutsche Mark, from the Deutsche Mark to the euros. And there were a couple of years, so here you see this, this um, uh, banknote, it's from 1999, and so for a couple of years we had this really nice um, money with Carl Friedrich Gauss on it, and during your exam in school, yeah, you would have to need it, and you could copy the formula of the Gaussian distribution from it, so super useful, right? I don't know how many money, how much money there is where there are mathematical formulas on it, but this is one, okay? By the way, I kept one, of course, right? So if you can find one, maybe they are now super expensive on eBay. Anyway, this is the Gaussian distribution, also using our notation, okay? And you understand the plot, right? I mean, the x is kind of the stuff that you are um, having. For example, the length of the feet or the height, it's measured in meters, right? And then we have the density, f of x, which is kind of telling us about um, yeah, how likely it is to see a certain value here, okay? And that relates also to an interesting question, I think on Rocket Chat or was it on Ilias? So what is now the unit of this f of x? That's kind of weird, right? And I will come back to that in a couple of slides. Yeah? So that's a fun topic, which you know, I think you will find these things on mass overflow or something. There you find the answers to such weird questions because you are not the only one who ask it. And that's also where I found like a good description. So let's start with the Gaussian distribution. Just copy the formula. So this is just a copy of the formula. And we introduce this notation here, which is like this curly n of x mu and sigma squared. So this is just a function with three inputs. OK, why not? So we also use the parameters as inputs here, because it's kind of useful, right? And we are computer scientists anyway, right? So why omit it? Why say, now this is p of x? It's like not precise. We know that mu and sigma is also an input, so be, let's be explicit. So they are all scalars, yeah? So here we are not talking about vectors and matrices yet, but this is a simple univariate case where everything is just a real number. And you know pi. I don't know how many digits you know. Um, there are sometimes some contests about it. Who knows more? So the, these two parameters, mu and sigma, they play a really nice role here. So the mu is the mean of x, OK? And the mean was defined to be this one here, OK? The expected value of the identity function, which was defined to be this integration. And one can show that the mu, this parameter, is equal to this integration. Try it at home and plug it in. So plug in this e to the something, plug it into x times this formula, and try to prove it. It's not super simple. It's not so easy. However, again, if you looked on mass overflow on these pages, you will find some really nice explanation how to derive it. But we always take it for granted that mu is the mean of the Gaussian distribution. No, in a way, mu is just some parameter in here, Okay, that you plug into this formula. And to really prove that mu is the mean, you have to solve this integral here, which is not super easy. Similarly, for the variance, the variance, um, we, it turns out sigma squared is the variance. That's no surprise for you, because you always call it sigma squared the variance. But sigma squared is just a parameter of some formula up here. So there's no guarantee that this is really the variance. So check it, right? So the variance was defined to be like the squared, uh, the average squared distance to the mean, OK? 
if we already say, OK, we can prove the first one, so we can say x minus mu. And if you plug everything in, you have another nice integration that you need to solve. And um, I, point, I have the pointer here to the mass uh, stack overflow page where they explain how to derive the mean and variance of a Gaussian random variable. It wasn't easy to find because like, it's so obvious that mu and sigma is the mean and the variance. So it's, it was quite hard to find the proof. That's why I put it in here. It's, it's useful to see it. So why do, do I tell it to you in length just so that you really understand what you're talking about? So that's why I'm stressing this. OK, sometimes the sigma is also called the standard deviation. And this is just a hack to have always a positive number. So you want to have a standard you want to have a variance that is like greater or equal than zero. So you introduce a variable and you square it. Yeah? And then you use it like a variable. Yeah? You, you never resolve this, the, this to the power of two. You never take the square root. Uh, you seldomly do. Okay? Often you just write sigma squared and you're happy once you derive a formula like this. Okay? Good. Um, however, talking about units, we will see that the unit of um, x, if it's meters, let's say our height, then the mu has the same unit, it's also meters, and the sigma squared has the unit meters squared. Okay, so if you want to make a, a plot and would say, whatever, you want to put the sigma onto your axis for the axis, you typically take the square root, right, to get to the same units. Right? Since variance is meter squared, standard deviation has the same unit as the variable x. And so you can plot it. It makes sense to put it onto the x-axis. Okay? So sometimes you see plots um, where you say, uh, maybe this is even the case. I'm not sure. But where you say, this is the first percentile or uh, the first something tile. And then this is the next one. So one standard deviation and the second standard deviation, and you can prove that 67% of the data falls into this confidence interval. And you could take twice the standard deviation in both directions, and you will have 97% of the data will fall into this interval. And it only makes sense to put it onto this axis here if it has the same unit. That's why you never say mu plus this sigma squared, it doesn't make sense. That should give you a type error right, in your programming language because they have different units. But mu plus sigma, that makes sense because they have the same units. OK, that's maybe more than you ever wanted to know about the Gaussian distribution, but I don't know. Maybe you enjoy that. I enjoy it. So um, now comes this nice question from, I think, Elias, or it was Rocket Chat. Is there an intuitive way for understanding the unit on the y-axis of the PDF? So what unit does the PDF have? Okay, great question, right? We never think about it. Typically, when we do this kind of math, we are always unitless. But of course, for, for a physicist, it's like super painful to be unitless. You always want to have units. And it also helps you sometimes finding mistakes. And there's a really nice book, which I would like to advertise. I think you can download it for free. It's called, um, I don't have it in my slides. It's called Street Fighting Mathematics. And that's a really nice book where they do really nice derivations just by looking at the units. Yeah? And then some super complicated integrations become super simple when you look at the units. So street fighting mathematics. I think you can download the PDF. So here comes a partial answer. So first of all, units. So now what does it mean, units? So in German, Einheiten, yeah? something like meter or seconds. There's another important notion, which is called dimension. Okay? Dimension is something like length or mass okay, or time, yeah, so that is a dimension, and then a dimension typically have, has certain units, for example, length could have the units meter or centimeters, yeah, square meters, not, square meters is like the unit of another dimension of area, okay, so there are these things like dimension and units, but let's focus here on the units, um, typically we could use these Ivan brackets, these squared brackets, to talk about units. So these are now not Iverson brackets, but this is the unit notation that you might know from physics. So you could write something like this, that the unit of mu is the same as the unit of x. OK, so that's something that one can show. Yeah, I hope one can show it. Or it should be the case. Otherwise, uh, um, density doesn't make sense, because you say x minus mu. And you cannot sum or subtract something with, with different units. right? That doesn't make sense. If you derive then the unit of the um, variance, you get 
the unit of x squared. Okay, so if the unit of x is meters, the standard deviation will, uh, the standard, uh, the variance will have meters squared. And now we can ask, what is the unit of this density function? And if you plug everything in, we start up here. So we have meters minus meters squared divided by meters squared. So we have e to the unitless, e to something unitless, which is good because the e function doesn't like units. Okay, so the units are gone before you pass it to the e function. That's a quite interesting observation. However, so the pi doesn't have a unit, but here comes the sigma. And the sigma is the square root of the sigma of the variance, so it will have unit meters. So it will be 1 divided by the unit of the x. That is the unit of the PDF. Okay? However, that is kind of strange. So it's something like the PDF measures something per meters. Okay? It's 15 <laughs> per meters. So let's fix a unit for probability or probability mass. Let's use kilogram. Okay? So it's not completely stupid because, um, so let's say we are, um, so we are having a Gaussian distribution on the board. And then let's take our, our chainsaw, yeah, or our Stichsäge, and let's kind of cut it out of the blackboard, okay? Then we have some really nicely shaped thing which looks something like this, right? And this thing you can put on a weight, and maybe it's three kilogram. Let's assume the mass of the whole thing is one kilogram, okay? So the mass of the whole thing will be one kilogram. This is like saying the probability of the whole thing is one kilogram, okay? That totally makes sense. Now, if we are interested, so what is the kind of the mass of these, these 97 percentiles. So how do we get it? We just chop it off and we put it onto our, our um, scale and it might turn out that the mass of, uh, let's draw it like this, I don't know, I hope you know what I mean. Okay, so of these two pieces, so that will be maybe something like 0 0.3 kilograms, something like 30 grams or something. Okay, this directly corresponds, of course, to the probabilities. Why? Because, I mean, how do you calculate these mass? If this is your density function, and it is a density function, right? If I take out an interval like this, if I chop it off, then the probability density function is telling me exactly what the mass of this thing should be, which is exactly related to the area. And the area, having something thick, is directly related to the mass. Okay, so in a way it makes sense to use kilograms here. So that means now if I have a probability density function of some variable, let's say height, okay, so this is basically the height measured in, in meters, then it will be kilogram per meter. So that is the probability, the, the PDF, the unit of the PDF. Probabilities will be kilogram and um, the other one, the, the um, PDF, this curve basically will have kilogram per meters if this one will have units of meters. Okay, so that is like a meaningful one. Of course, why not introduce like a new a name for probabilities? I don't know whether someone did already, so you could be creative now. And when you give a lecture, maybe you can invent one, okay, for probabilities. I don't know what would be a good one. By the way, maybe it's all related to information theory and this kind of thing where we're talking about bits and information content and maybe probability something like inverse information content or something or information content squared or logarithm of information content. So maybe there is already a unit out there and we not just have to think about it harder, okay? So that's a very interesting question. If I, if I find one related to information theory, I will tell you. Good. So that is a, like a partial answer to the, this question here. I hope um, it's helpful. So basically it's the, the units of the x and the inverse of it. But if we would have a nice unit for this probability mass yeah, integrating along the PDF, then it would be kilogram per, me per meters, for example. So that would be an answer here. So why is it nice? I mean, because 
again, s putting the physicist hat on. I'm not a physicist, by the way, not at all. But the unit stuff I really like. Suppose you are omitting in your formula the squared. Yeah? By looking at the units, you will see that you will have e to the 1 divided by meter, which is not allowed. So the e function always needs a unitless quantity. So there's a mistake in your formula. Okay? So you, just by looking at the units, you can automatically find out if something is wrong. Also with the units, sometimes you can guess exponents in polynomials or these kind of things. So there are many funny things that you could do. OK, anyway, where did we come from? OK, it was just this question. And this is a curious answer. Yeah, This is just fun stuff. There won't be a question on it in the exam, on the units. Yeah, this is just for the curious. So let's get back to this one. So we defined the univariate Gaussian distribution. And now we want to show nice properties of it. OK? In particular, we are interested in the sum rule and the product rule. How does it look for a Gaussian distribution, right? That would be super useful, because then when we do probabilistic inference with Gaussian distributions, maybe they are nice formulas. And as I gave you a hint, you just need linear algebra then at the end to do the calculations, OK, for probabilistic inference with Gaussians. However, before we can prove these formulas, um, I need to show you some lemma which now more complicates the whole stuff. So I show you it at a glance. So this is like some complicated properties of this function. But once we believe those, um, the, re the rest becomes more easy. So let's start at the top, where everything is easy. So first of all, this function n, yeah, which I defined, I just defined the PDF here, it is really a probability density function. So for this, I need to prove that it's always greater or equal than 0. And I need to say that it integrates to 1. Okay? So again, for the integration to 1, yeah, you need to struggle a bit with the integration over the e of minus x squared. But there are some tables where you can look at. And actually, there are some tricks with complex analysis to show that it has something to do with square root of 2 pi. And then it cancels out against the other square root of 2 pi. OK, that's basically the approximate proof. Again, mass overflow is your friend here that can, can help you. Um, then the next thing is it's symmetric in x and mu. So that is an interesting observation, which we only come up with because kind of they are like equal, right? We don't care. Both are inputs to this function n, right? They don't have special roles here. And it's easy to see that x and mu could be switched. It doesn't matter whether you say x minus mu or mu minus x. OK, that's the same thing. The function is the same. And that's sometimes useful when you do these Gaussian calculations, that you observe that, that you can flip these. Then there's another one. Um, this function is an exponential of a second degree polynomial. OK, so that's, that's more complicated. So let's try to understand it. So it's an exponential of something. So it is something, an e function, e to the something. OK. So there is an e to the something in there, but there's also a constant. So the constant needs to be dragged into the e function. And of course, you can do it by, uh, I guess, taking the logarithm of the thing in front. And then you have, um, one div then you have e to the logarithm of something times e to the something. And then you use the roots for e to the something to merge it into one expression. OK? And I've wrote it out for you. And I've wrote this. Now, this, the input here says it should be a second degree polynomial in x. So why is that a second degree polynomial in x? OK, there's one term with x to the 0. Then there's a term with x to the 1. And there's a term with x squared. And those are the polynomials. OK? And we have coefficients in front of them. And they get some nice names. And the constant also gets a nice name. And I wrote everything down here that you need to really prove it for yourself that this is true. So if you choose the eta to be sigma minus squared times mu, for whatever reason, OK? And you say the lambda squared is sigma minus squared, OK? And you choose the a to be this expression, where here you see the logarithm. Here's the logarithm of the 2 pi. And then there's also a logarithm of some lambda, which is basically the standard deviation. And if you plug this in this expression and you reshuffle the whole thing, you get back the Gaussian distribution. OK? Why is it useful to have found this out, that it can be written as the exponential of a second degree polynomial? Because later on, when we do inference, we multiply p of x 
yeah, the prior with some likelihood, and if both are Gaussian distributions, we are multiplying to Gaussians. If both are e to the second order degree polynomial, then e to the something times e to the something is the same as e to the something plus the other one, okay? And the sum of two second order degree polynomials is again a second order degree polynomial because the degree cannot increase, right? Because you are just summing up something with x squared, with x, and with x to the zero. Okay, so it makes things easier if we have this form. And they also have a name. They are called the canonical or natural parameters, these newfound parameters here, these eta and lambda. Somehow the eta plays the role of the mean, kind of, right? It's somehow a renormalized mean, kind of. And the lambda plays the role of the inverse variance, and the inverse variance has also a name. It's called precision. And if you think about it, Variance is telling you how much spread you have, and precision is how precise you are at a certain location. And they are exactly the inverse of each other. So if you have a very large spread around a value, your precision is very low. If you have a very small variance, your precision is very high. Okay? So nicely it all makes sense. Um, and then there's the statement, any second order degree polynomial yeah, that you write. So this is now a sum second order degree polynomial, where this, this letter C is a number greater than zero, okay? Any of those induces an anomalized Gaussian distribution, where you can choose the eta in a certain way and the lambda in another way, okay? And then by choosing the A cleverly, yeah, as you've seen, the A has kind of the, is, is kind of the normalizer, so it doesn't depend on x. It's the one that ensures that the integration will be one at the end. It's like having a, a prefactor. Okay, so any second order polynomial will lead to a Gaussian distribution. Why do we need that as well? Again, as I said, you take a prior, which is a Gaussian distribution, you multiply it with the likelihood, which is a Gaussian distribution, and by plugging in this formula, it turns out the product will be also the exponential of a second order degree polynomial. However, can we be sure that this is also a Gaussian distribution at the end? And point four says, yes, you can be sure. If the, this coefficient c is greater than zero, everything is fine and you have a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so this is a very, very powerful lemma. And now we can use it to do inference with univariate Gaussians. Okay, so here's my prior, so it's just some distribution over x, and it should be a Gaussian distribution with some mean and some variance, and I have a likelihood where now, in this case, now my variable x is the mean, okay? So this is a particular choice, and there are other choices, but the other choices don't lead to nice mathematics. But this is the one that we can solve. So if you choose this first random variable to be the mean of the second random variable, then you can derive the posterior very nicely and everything stays Gaussian, okay? So assume that all of those constants are fixed and known. What is the posterior here? So for this, let's write down base rule and let's plug in our, um, our densities, okay? As I said, base rule for continuous variables needs to be applied to the densities, okay? That's just how it is, and that's very nice and useful. So now we need to kind of make a derivation that the product of these two divided by the integration is again a Gaussian distribution, okay? And how do we do this? We remember that such a function could be always written like an exponential of a second order degree polynomial. So the other one can be also written like that, and we don't worry about the exact form of A and D and B and E and C and F. Yeah, we just know that there is one. We plug it in here, okay? And that just leads to the summation of these two polynomials because e to the something times e to something else is e to something plus something else. That's just the rule for the exponential function. So, great. And since here we again have a second order degree polynomial, we know that the top part is a Gaussian. What about the bottom one? The bottom one has also variable x, which is here the relevant variable, but it's integrated out. So the bottom one is just constant, okay? So the top piece has the right form of being a second order degree polynomial, okay? So it has the right form. This is something like a Gaussian. And the bottom thing is just a constant. 
And by shuffling around, this bottom term I can also put into the e to the something by taking logarithm of it, and I can move it into this constant term here. So I can reshuffle everything, and there must be some new, some new mean and some new variance, which I can derive from a plus d, b plus e, on the c plus f. Okay? So this derivation should show you that the posterior for these choices here for the prime and the likelihood will be also a Gaussian distribution. And when you go through the math, you will derive these formulas. And of course, some of you might want to do it by hand themselves, so I put all the information on the next slide. So if you use b equals this stuff and so on and so forth, then the derivation just goes through. So there's nothing surprising shouldn't happen. There should nothing happen. Maybe there's a typo on this slide. Yeah? If, if no student checks, there are, the typos will remain. Um, so curiously, we don't have to calculate the normalization, okay? Since we know the top part is the second order polynomial in x, and in the bottom part there is no x, okay? So it's constant. So the whole thing is the exponential of a second order polynomial, and then it, there must be a Gaussian distribution for it. Okay, so this is very nice. Um, of course, you could change, take a different route. You could also plug in here the definition of the Gaussian distribution, and you can plug in the definition of the Gaussian distribution, and then you do the derivation by hand, and you will end up with this expression. But like going this path with the exponential of second order degree polynomial is very short. Okay, then the derivation is really short. And if you do it the other way around, it's super large and gigantically large. Good, so far so good. So the denominator does not depend on x, as I said, since it's integrated out. Um, now we can also interpret the formula. Um, let me try to interpret it. So this was my prior. So I said kind of on average it should be mu. That's what I know beforehand. Now I see new data, right? Uh, no, not now I'm not seeing new data. Uh, let me again. No. So my whatever, the average height, whatever, is something like 180. That's before seeing any data. But then I'm in a special class, and they are all like first class students, OK? First class meaning first grade students. Yeah? And then my prior said it's, they are all 180. But then it turns out this is kinder uni. Yeah? And so I, I get my. Um, I get very unlikely observations. If I would sample my y's, they would be spread around the 180 thing, right? But um, now my measurement y here that I get in, like the first person I measure, it's like 1 meter, so 80 centimeters. So um, given that I have now this new observation, I should correct my belief about the average x, right? So about the distribution of the x. And so I should do inferences. So what is my new mean? My new mean is the average of my initial guess, 1 meter 80, and my observation. Okay? And so it's kind of averaging between the two. So the formula looks a bit complicated, but actually what it says is, so you put a certain weight on the mu, and you put another weight on the y, and you sum it up. However, if you take a weighted average, your weights should sum up to 1. So that's where you get this term down here. So that is basically normalizing the weights sigma minus one, uh, sigma to the minus two, and tau to the minus two. So this is so essential, and actually it's so simple. I show you on the board, right? Maybe you've seen. I show you only the simple stuff on the board because otherwise I, I also couldn't do it. So suppose now the weight one is sigma minus two, and then there's another weight tau to the minus one. So those are weights. By the way, what does it mean? When is the, when is the weight large? It's large if, if my variance is very small. So if my measurement is very precise, yeah, then it gets a really large weight. It should really influence the average a lot. If my variance is very large, I, I were only like estimating it like this. The variance is very large, so the weight is very small. Now if I would take two values, let's say there's the y value, which was my mean, I weight it with w1, and I average it with w2, which was the measurement of y. So that's the way right, to have a weighted average. However, here's the problem. w1 plus w2 um, should be equal to 1. Otherwise, it's not a weighted average. right? So 
They must be one, otherwise it doesn't make sense. If there's an arbitrary scaling in here, yeah, I'm averaging them, but I'm multiplying them with 10 to the 15. So this can happen, right? If the weights are super large. Could happen if I have super precise measurement devices, some laser or something. So this variance could be really small, and so the weights get really large. So before doing this, I need to normalize it. And how do I normalize it? I normalize with W1 plus W2. So if I take, ah, okay, now this is, so let's say those are tilde now, okay? So those are the normalized ones, and I should use the normalized ones because they are summing up to one, okay? And now if you look back to the stuff on my um, slides, that's exactly what's happening down here. So if you could take this denominator and you move it to the first weight and you can move it to the second weight. So this is just a weighted average of two numbers, okay? And the weights are depending on how strong was my belief that mu is the right choice. If the sigma squared is super small, I say the spread is really small, so today people are all, whatever, 180 plus minus 5 centimeters, very small, then the weight that my mu gets after my first observation is really large, okay? If I say, yeah, it's typically 180, yeah, but I already taught some kinder uni, okay? In that case, basically, my spread might be larger, and so it gets overruled quite quickly by my measurement, okay? <coughs> what about this term? Can we also understand that one? So that one is also curious. Basically, now we also have a word for the inverse variance. It's a precision, okay? So the new variance is, is the inverse of the sum of the precisions. Okay, so basically if both were super precise, I'm summing up the precision, so precision is getting larger and larger with more and more, more, and more me measurements. So if I have more measurements, I'm getting more and more precise, so the precision is increasing, which means that the variance is decreasing. Okay, that's why you get this weird one divided by something to the squared. By the way, if you write down this formula for the natural parameters, of course the these precisions are just summed up, you just sum up the precisions. And this part gets much nicer, okay? However, here, kind of since we are talking about the variances, we first convert the variances into precisions, then we sum up the precisions, and then again we convert it back to variances, okay? So that is what's happening here. Um, so that was the nitty-gritty detail for do the, if you want to do the derivations again. Let's have several observations. So let's say we have this prior for x, and we have several observations y sub i, okay? But all with the same parameters. Then we can write down the same formulas, but now we are interested in p of x, given now that I have measured um, 100 students here, okay? And as you can see, again, I have a weighted average over here, but now I'm basically averaging the y i's, and the weight um, is kind of everything is accumulating here, yeah? So the more measurements I make, I'm really overruling my initial guess mu with this one, right? Because here I'm having basically n times tau to the minus 2 as a precision, right? So the precision of these measurements, the weight gets really large compared to my initial guess, okay? So at some point, kind of the first stuff is irrelevant, what I put in here, right? Because I'm only averaging this stuff. Because this n times tau to the minus 2 is going to infinity, okay? And that's why the first term is ignore. By the way, also my variance gets really, really small the more measurements I make because the n is getting larger and larger and larger and larger, okay? So it all makes sense. There was an excellent question also somewhere, what about this z? What is z1? Why do you write z? What is it, by the way? So I'm just too lazy to write it down. So it's 1 divided by the evidence. So it's the normalization constant, and it's constant with respect to x. It's not constant with respect to y1 to yn. It's not constant with respect to the parameters, but it is constant with respect to x. That's what a normalization constant in this context means. You might ask, why is it called z? Z is, since there was a German word for it, Zustandssumme. So it's the sum of all states. So um, summa aller Zustände, and that's again physics, that's like statistical physics, I think from Boltzmann, or I think he 
um, was summing up all possibilities, like I guess something like molecules somewhere in some in a box or something, and summing up over everything gives you this Z. It's a Zustandsumme, which also kind of makes sense because like we are calculating probabilities like that, right? So you have a certain likelihood or a certain probability for your observation, and you normalize it with all other possibilities. And that is what the Z is, the Zustandsumme. Okay, Summe aller Zustände. Good. And the same holds for the beta distribution. They are also used the Z. And I had a Z for five observations, I had a Z for four observations, and those were instances of the beta function. Again, the, the, the constant Z was constant with respect to the variables that we were talking about in the, with this beta distribution. It's not constant with respect to the parameters. Okay, so far so good. Um, let's do the same thing again. Same calculation, but now multivariate Gaussian distribution. Okay, and why is it nice? It's exactly the same. Yeah? You just need to go from scalars to vectors and matrices. And the, re the rest of the derivation, yeah, you can do it one to one, do the same derivation. right? And if you are kind of approximately happy with this derivation, going from the Gaussians to the exponential of second order degree polynomials, and then going back, yeah, then you will be happy with the derivation for the multivariate one. If you want to do the multivariate one by hand, of course you could do, but the calculation gets even more larger than already for the univariate situation. Now, what does this multivariate thing here mean? So multivariate means now our Gaussian variable here is not a scalar, yeah, like a real number, but now it's a vector. Okay, So it's a Gaussian vector, if you would like to say that. So now it's, it's from the R to the N. Okay. So what does it mean? We said mu and x have the same units. Yeah? So mu must be, of course, a vector of the same shape. Yeah? So that's the mean vector. Um, what about sigma? The sigma becomes a matrix. And now this is a covariance matrix. And so similarly, for being positive, so the sigma squared should be like something positive, non-zero, so not even non-negative, but it should be also non-zero, because we divide by it. Now the sigma must be also something positive. And from linear algebra, so positivity on the real numbers is generalized to matrices with basically positive definiteness. Okay? So being positive definite means something like being positive for the real numbers. So the definition of positive definiteness was something like if you throw in uh, some, I can also put it on the board, and it's something, it's not super difficult. But um, so a matrix A is positive definite if and only if for all vectors V, V times A times V is greater than 0. OK, so why now does this make sense? OK, we know what greater than 0 means for real numbers. So we need to make sure that this is a real number, right? So is it a real number? Let's draw some shapes. So the A is a squared matrix. Looks like this. We multiply it with the column vector V. So the V is a vector. So it should be from the R to the D. If the A is from the R to the D cross D. And we multiply it from the right-hand side. And we multiply it transposed from the left-hand side. And then if you do row times column, row times column, and so on and so forth, then basically the whole thing will be a point. Okay? So maybe I say more about it, but the, the short story is these kind of vector could be also seen like a matrix. So this is a matrix matrix multiplication where the inner dimensions must agree. So inner dimensions here means that the number of columns of this one must be the same as the number of rows of that one. And the number of columns of A must be the same as the number of rows of, as of B. Okay? And then the output will be the outer dimensions, which is here 1 and 1. So this thing will be a scalar. So this is positivity defined for matrices. The other requirement here is um, that it's, oh, that's the wrong button. So here we go. That it's a symmetric matrix. OK? That's another thing that you need. OK? And it has, why would, we will see why we need it, because then we will have exactly the properties that we need for the lemma. Okay, 
Now let's look at the expression here. So we have x minus mu. Okay, this is just the sum or difference of two vectors. That's so far so good. Transposed. Okay, that looks very much like the thing on the board. Times an inverse matrix. Okay, matrices can be inverted if they are positive definite. Okay, so that's already something. And then times x minus mu, which is again a column vector. So maybe let me, um, maybe should, I should show it on the board. Um, yeah, should work like this. My, do I still have place on the board? Yeah. So in my notation, it's basically. So I would draw here um, a column vector minus a column vector in brackets transposed times the inverse of a matrix will have the same shape times this. So if you, uh, what, this is not a one now here, but this is the shape of my vector, okay? So this, this should just be a, a straight line, okay? And this is a square, so this is the shape of my matrix. And the lengths of these ones, they must agree with all the other ones. <clears throat> now, if I take two vectors, I will get another vector, and if I transpose it, I'm basically changing the shape like this. And then I have that one, the difference is again a vector, and then at the end <coughs> I will get a dot, okay? These things are always important to do to check whether your expression makes sense. In particular in Python, right? If you program MATLAB, MATLAB is super strict with this kind of stuff, and if you have a simple mistake in your shapes with your matrices, um, you will, it will yell at you with an error message. Uh, Python, NumPy, um, doesn't yell at you. It does some convenience functions like broadcasting and stuff. So the, there you can have a vector and you can add it to a matrix. And it doesn't yell at you. That, that's a mistake because it's just repeating the vector until it fits. But it might be a bug, okay? So it's convenient and efficient, but it can lead to bugs sometimes. Anyway, these kind of shape discussions can help you. I'm always pressing here the wrong buttons. So, okay, let's go on with that one. So, now we figured out this thing up here is a scalar, which is good because then we know what the exponential function is doing. We know only the exponential function for scalars, right? There is a matrix exponential, but that's again something weird that we leave for the physicists for now, okay? So, e to the something, e to the simple scalar is something we know. So, that makes sense. Now, what about the other thing here? So we will have um, these bars, and the bars basically is the determinant of this matrix, okay? And the determinant of a positive definite matrix is a positive number, okay? Which is good because we divide by it, so it should never ever be zero. And it also kind of makes sense that we put these bars here, right? Because it looks like a positive number that's coming out of it. Then to the power of a half, it's like taking the square root of something. So it's like taking the square root of the variance. And then we multiply it with 2 pi to the power of n and the square root of it. Okay, so that is the um, PDF of a multivariate Gaussian. So we see the input is a vector, another vector, and a matrix with certain properties, and the output will be a scalar. Okay, that's the PDF. Good. Uh, now, the first thing is, of course, these kind of things can be also written for vectors, right? Nobody stops us from writing expectation of a vector-valued function. That's okay. We can also do it for a matrix-valued function. So now, what is this one here? Again, let's look at the board. Um, so it's basically the outer product. It's like a column vector times a row vector, and there the shape, the output shape, will be a matrix. Okay, because you're always doing row times column, row times column, row times column, and so on. And then you do again row times blah, blah, blah. And by this you are generating all the different possibilities. Okay? Good. So we can also write the expectation notation for having the expectation over a matrix, and it all makes sense, and it can be shown that this is equal to sigma. Okay? Great. This is the determinant, as I said. Uh, yeah, all eigenvalues are positive. That's another description of positive definiteness. Um, now, important, important observation, the univariate case we looked at already is a special case of this notation. So that's also important always to note. So if n is equal to 1 in this case, so n being here the dimensionality of my vectors, I think on the board I use d, but let's say n is the dimensionality of my vectors, in that case, 
um, now the x minus mu becomes for n equals 1, it's just two scalars, right? And my n by n matrix is just a scalar as well, okay? And being positive definite translates for one by one matrices, positive definiteness means that the entry, the single entry is positive, okay? That's exactly the same thing. By the way, it's also the eigenvalue of a one by one matrix. Okay, as a side note, this expression up here is also called Mahalanobis distance, okay? It's a distance measure where you kind of put some ellipses instead of having circles, and uh, on circles everything has the same distance to the center, you have something like ellipses, and everything that is on the ellipses has the same distance from the center. So that's the Mahalanobis distance, just as a pointer. When you see it somewhere, look back to the slide, the ellipse is described by this matrix sigma, okay? Actually by the eigenvectors of this matrix sigma. We will get to that again when we talk about PCA. Good, so far so good. This is the definition of the multivariate Gaussian. Let's look at all the properties, and those are the identical properties as the other one had. Just, we need to be a bit careful. First of all, it in, it's always greater than zero for the same reason. It integrates to one. It's symmetric in x and mu. Okay, so far so good. And now it's also the exponential of a second degree polynomial. So this might come as a surprise because now where, what is x squared, right? So that's kind of weird. So we need to think a bit, little bit out of the box here. So let's look at this. So this is the constant term, a times x to the zero, okay? x to the zero, if x is a vector, let's say it's just one, okay? So that kind of makes sense. And then now we had something like eta times x, and now eta is a vector, yeah, since it's related to the mean. And so we take the inner product of these two vectors, okay? So if we have a polynomial where the variable x is a vector, then the linear term is just the inner product of another vector with my parameter vector here. So a second order degree polynomial for scalars has a coefficient a0, which is the real number, and a coefficient a1, which is also a real number for vector valued polynomials, or not vector, for vector input polynomials, the parameter a1 is a vector itself, okay? It gets even more exciting over here. So here my parameter is not a scalar anymore, but for vector input polynomials it is a matrix, and I'm replacing the x squared basically with the outer, uh, with multiplying it from the left and from the right to the matrix to get a scalar, okay? So this is a scalar again, and it's basically using the first component squared, the second component squared, and also all possible cross terms. So for these polynomials where my x is a vector, yeah, my second degree terms include all possible products of two variables. Okay, and each of them get a coefficient, and the coefficients are written down in a matrix, since there are n squared possibilities to combine x1 with x2 and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is just generalizing everything. However, again, I wrote down everything in detail here, and you now need some linear algebra magic to do the calculations, to figure it out that that's the same stuff. Okay, good, so far so good. Again, one can also say, if I have a second degree polynomial, any of them, and C here is a positive definite matrix, then it will also induce a Gaussian distribution, okay? Same statement. Now just slightly more sophisticated. Okay, I show you, I just flash it at you. So this is exactly the same derivation as before. Nothing happened. I'm, I, it happened that I'm now using vectors, but that's it. The rest of the derivation stays the same. I'm having now a prior over a vector. I'm now having a likelihood where y is a vector and x is a vector, okay? And if you're happy with the other derivation, you should be happy with this derivation too. You again plug in these Gaussians, you again plug in the second order degree polynomials, and again, we have the right properties to do these kind of summing up two polynomials with the same tricks, and again, we can read off the solution, okay? However, it's looking a little bit more complicated now. Before, we had a certain weighting in front of our mu, and we had a certain weighting in front of our y. Now we kind of rotate spaces and rescale the space with multiplying it with a matrix. 
So the inverse covariance matrix is a precision matrix. And this matrix can rotate and rescale the whole space. And it's just a weighting. It's the same effect like a weighting. Okay? And again, those two things rotate the stuff in such a way that if your measurement was super precise in some of the coordinates of y, yeah, those get amplified by the rotation and rescaling, and the directions in the y, which were not super precise, as expressed by the covariance matrix, they get kind of um, reduced. What about the normalization? Again, the normalization is something like take the weights, sum them up, and divide by them, which translates now in matrix world to this expression. So you sum up the precision matrices, and you take the inverse and multiply it with the rest. But this is basically the same thing as before, but now with matrices. And this might blow up your head for now, but when you look at the univariate case, and again you compare it, those are exactly the same steps. Just the operations are a bit more complicated. The same holds for the variance that turns out at the end to be the inverse sum of the precision matrices. It's the same story as before. Good, again, for your pleasure, those are all the expressions that you need to rederive it. Okay? Just plug everything in and everything should be fine. Yeah? There's no magic happening beyond this stuff that I've shown you. Um, again, no normalization since we have this polynomial independent of x and everything. The reasoning is completely the same. Okay, so far so good. You might wonder whether I fit the last stuff in the last 10 minutes. Let's see. Yeah. We haven't seen the sum rule yet. We haven't seen the product rule. I won't prove everything anymore, okay? But I just wanted to do this in detail because it shows you how to prove all the other stuff too. Okay, let's go on. Um, now let's talk a bit about Gaussian joint distributions, okay? So suppose we have this setup that there's a Gaussian prior and we have a Gaussian likelihood. We could also in general say that the joint distribution P of x comma y being this product as we've seen already, is the exponential of two second order degree polynomials, possibly with vector inputs, okay? So this is the Gaussian distribution, but we can be more explicit. We can write it out like this, okay? And then this might be a curious thing. Why is there a y at that location? Why are there two y's? Is that a typo? Shouldn't there be an x or something? Yeah? The reason being, Kind of when we talk about y alone, okay, without talking about the x, we kind of need to get the most average x that there is, and the most average x that there is is the mu. And so if we don't talk about in this row, kind of we are not talking about the x directly, that's why here we have again a mu, okay? We will see it when we you look at the sum rule, okay, why this is the case. Good, so this can be Having written down these ones, we can also explicitly write down basically the covariance matrix. Where I'm now here using a funny notation with the squared brackets. So typically when we use these squared brackets, we put scalars, right, to describe a matrix. But let's abstract a bit from it. In principle, I can put also matrices in here if the shapes are right. Yeah? So I can make larger matrices from smaller matrices. And that's exactly the notation that I'm using here. Okay? Okay. No proof for that one, but I hope you trust me that this is th the case. I mean, it's just a rewritten thing of the stuff that we've seen on the previous slide. Here's the product rule for Gaussians. Okay, so the product rule is telling us something like, yeah, this is almost base rule, but if we do it for Gaussian distributions in this setup where the x is the mean of the y, yeah, we can have another interesting form which looks like that. So kind of we can derive a mean for the y, which is independent of x, and we can derive a mean for the x, which depends on y now. Yeah, so when you look at this, the x doesn't depend on anything, the y depends on x. That is this side. Here the y depends on nothing, but the x depends on the y. That is the right-hand side here. However, the mu is missing from this for simplicity, so it's hidden in the new. If you look at the definition of the mu, you will see that there is a mu, the, the mu in here. Okay, so this is exactly the product rule derived for Gaussian distributions. And you know, you don't have to memorize these formulas at all, right? So this is more like a collection of formulas, these slides, where you can look them up when you have a derivation. Yeah? 
Nobody knows them by hand. I couldn't, by heart, I couldn't write them out just by putting them out of my sleeves, okay? So it's, um, it's really difficult. There are alternative ways to write this, so many variations. So here's one variation. Suppose we have in some derivation some weird thing like um, x, comma a and x, comma b, which is weird because we would have two densities of x, but it could happen if we switch the mean and the variable, right? Then suddenly we could have something like that. Then there's another way to isolate all the terms that are related to the x and push everything else into some other terms. So that's another way to derive an interesting product rule here, okay? What else can we do? Gaussian marginals and conditionals. So suppose we have this Gaussian distribution, which is the joint distribution of two variables x and y. First of all, you could think of x and y being scalars, but x and y could be vectors themselves. They don't have to have the same shape. I mean, they could have one could be longer than the other. It's all super flexible. Now, the me so it's a, it's a Gaussian distribution over the vectors stacked on top of each other. The mean has two vectors stacked on top of each other. And the covariance is like, like a matrix which is made out of four matrices that you push, put at the exact locations. So those operations correspond to v stack and h stack, like in NumPy, okay? Stacking stuff on top of each other. So if this is your starting point, one can calculate the Gaussian marginals by integrating this out, and it turns out you can just read off the upper part of the mean vector, and you take out the upper left corner of the covariance matrix to use the sum rule, okay? Similarly for the y, and you can also derive formulas for calculating Gaussian conditionals. So conditioning on y, okay, will lead to a certain mean for the x where the y is now getting into play. So all the information I get from the y will influence the mean of the posterior, basically, right? And similarly, the variances of my y and the covariances here, they will influence like the covariance matrix of my posterior about x, okay? Everything goes in here. And it also all kind of makes sense if the y knows a lot about it, so that means that the b is very large, so the, in the covariance matrix kind of, the, the, the off-diagonal entries tell me how much is the x related to the y. That's something that the b is telling me, okay? So suppose it's super large. They are varying together very much. It means that also I will subtract something from my current covariance, and it's related to how large the b is. So the larger the b, the more I'm subtracting from it. So summing out the y, if the y is telling me, oh no, conditioning on the y, if the y is telling me a lot about x, it means the entries in b are large, which means my covariance of the resulting distribution is strongly reduced, okay? Can it be negative? No, it can't. There's an inequality that this thing will be always positive definite, okay? One can prove that, that that's the case. And it's following from the fact that this guy over here is positive definite, okay? It has something to do with the sure product. Yeah, so some numeric stuff. Okay, so far so good. Uh-oh, not so much time left. Let's look at the summation rule. So the summation rule is about integrating out stuff. And when I again looked at these slides in the morning, I thought, ah, there's something missing. Isn't there something missing? So. Um, what is this? But this is exactly the translation. So the P of Y is Z1, yeah? And it is originating from integrating out the X of this more complicated distribution. So this is, again, the joint distribution of two vectors, or of two Gaussian dis Gaussians, where I wrote out basically the different pieces of my covariance matrix. And curiously, summing out the X basically means reading off the bottom corner part here. Why does, with summing out, the x not influence the y? Because I'm summing out all possibilities, kind of. So it's, it's becoming irrelevant. It's a non-interesting part. I haven't observed the x, I sum it out. And so it's not influencing the y at all, but only what's relevant is the c. Similar the other way around. Here's another one, linear transformation of a Gaussian distribution, of a Gaussian variable. So suppose we have a random variable that is Gaussian distributed. And now suppose we have a linear transformation, yeah? Then also, 
if I transform my variable x with a matrix and add something to it, so I get a new random variable, yeah? also in that case, I will have a Gaussian distribution. And so now, what is the formula for variance and mean? Basically, apply the same transformation to the mean, okay? And the scaling of the x will influence the covariance. Curious, right? So the plus b doesn't influence the variance. Why is that the case? The plus b is just shifting your distribution around in space. It's not changing the spread of it, okay? If it had a certain spread here, it was about the spread around the mean. If I'm moving the mean around, the spread stays the same. Okay, so it all makes sense. Um, with this formula, you could also show that the sum of two Gaussian random variables is again a Gaussian. Okay, so if z is equal to x plus y, this could be written like multiplying x and y with the matrix 1, 1. If x and y are vectors, then those are identity matrices here, identity matrix next to another identity matrix. And from this formula, kind of, we can read off the parameters of that one. It will be the summation of the means, okay? And then the covariance, I think, yeah, there will be also some summation happening. And this, by the way, is another way to prove that the convolution of two Gaussian PDFs is again a Gaussian PDF. Because, so this is again super knowledge from other lectures, if the PDF of the sum of two random variables is the convolution of the two PDFs, or in German, it's the Faltung, okay? If you take two PDFs and you take the Faltung, which is exactly the same as the convolution, you get the PDF of the sum of two random variables. And that holds for any distribution, also for Gaussian distribution, okay? Good, more notation. I'm almost there, but I haven't, done, I haven't shown you the coding. So maybe I go five minutes over time to show you the coding. Students don't like that, but yeah, I, I will do it. I try to be faster next time. So we wrote p of x being equal to this weird curly n, okay? However, sometimes we also write a bar here. Actually, most of the time we will write a bar here because it intuitively makes more sense. Given the mu and the sigma, the x is, has a certain distribution. So this is stressing the fact that this function curly n is a PDF, okay? Is a probability density function. So typically we write a bar here. And only during this lecture I put a comma, yeah, because otherwise switching x and mu is kind of weird if you interpret it as probabilities. But if you just view it like a certain function that is defined in a certain way, kind of flipping arguments kind of makes sense. Okay? But typically we write a bar. So this is the summary. Products of Gaussians are Gaussians, marginals of Gaussians are Gaussians, conditionals of Gaussians are Gaussians, linear mappings of Gaussians are Gaussians. Okay? So that is the summary of what we've seen today. This is what you need to remember. And then the formulas, you, you should yeah, look them up, okay? Or be able to derive them even nicer. But this is something that you should know. Everything is nice with Gaussians. So here's a statement from Philip Hennig again. Gaussians are for probability what affine linear mappings are for algebra. Okay? So algebra is like anything with polynomials and blah, blah, blah. Super, can be super complicated up to algebraic geometry. The simple stuff is the linear algebra where everything can be described with matrices and mappings. Similarly here, there are many complicated distributions, right? I tell you how they look. They are exponentials of arbitrary polynomials, okay, with certain properties. But in principle, you can plug in any polynomial, and the coefficients of these polynomials are the higher order moments of these distributions. However, Gaussian distributions, the interesting moments are only the second order moments, which is the covariance matrix, and the first order moments, which is the mean. But in principle, there could be more, and that corresponds to e to the uh, complicated polynomial. You might wonder, how do you do it for vectors? It can be done with tensors. A tensor has three sides, so you can multiply a vector on each of the sides. But the notation in 2D is not so nice anymore. OK, so that is a very deep statement. So Gaussians are represented as a matrix and a vector, right? Covariance and a mean. And so distributions and these affine linear mappings they can be used to approximate more complicated stuff, right? A Taylor expansion of first order is approximating a complicated function 
with a linear function. And similarly, we can approximate complicated probability distribution with a Gaussian distribution by just saying, what's, where's the location? Where's the mean? And what is the spread? And that's an approximation to a very complicated one. And then algorithms and mass get simple, as you've seen today. However, it's a bit complicated. So I'm over two minutes already. I show you the code very briefly. So what was the code for today? I wanted to do a little class for Gaussian distributed random variables, okay, where you can, I need some helper function as well, so how do I go on? And so here's my class. It should allow you to define a Gaussian distributed random variable, which is represented as a mean and a variance, and you can sum up two variables and it will do the right thing. You can minus two variables and it will do the right thing. You can multiply it with a scalar and it will do the right thing. If you multiply two Gaussian distributions, you are out of our system. Then you get a chi-square distribution. You are not in Gaussian world anymore. Yeah, okay, that's unfortunate, but that's how it is. You can sample from it, uh, and here's the code. You can take a linear transformation of a Gaussian distribution and you get a new Gaussian distribution. You can use the sum rule and you get a Gaussian distribution. And you can condition on part of the entries and you get a Gaussian distribution. So if you don't like the mass, the mass is super useful to derive super nice classes here, which then you can use to have nice code. So what can we do? Excuse me, we can generate a random variable and we can simply just condition on other variables and sample from conditioned variables and play around with them, okay? Another point of view here is in NumPy you have vectors and with this extension you have vectors with covariance matrices, so vectors with error bars, which is like super cool if you have it because then you can take your algorithms, you, you run an optimization algorithm gradient descent or something, but now you don't run it on NumPy vectors, but you run it on Gaussian vectors, and then you have the same algorithm running, but it will generate you the correct covariance matrix at the end of your algorithm, which is super fancy, right? I mean, you do a computation, and the output of, the product, pro, uh, of your program is not only the answer, but it's the answer plus error bars, okay? And you can get it for free when you use the class like that. However, the implementation is still a bit, uh, there are some problems with extending ND arrays in, in NumPy. There are some links in the code. Okay, thanks for your uh, extended attention. We see each other again on Wednesday.